Venice is different from the rest of Italy. During the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance, its fortunes were built on maritime trade with the East, and Venice's ties to Byzantium were stronger than anywhere else in Italy. Venetians of the upper class did not attend humanist academies. They were sent to sea as boys. Maybe as a result, the interests of the ruling class tended to be less intellectual, more focused on nature, and perhaps more sensual as well. But above all, Venice was and is a city bathed in light, light bouncing off its canals, light reflecting from the mosaics that decorate its Byzantine-style churches, including St. Mark's, and light shining through its most famous product, glass. No, this is not, as you probably guessed, a Renaissance painting. It's actually an Impressionist painting of the city of Venice by Monet. Uh, but I stuck it in because it so wonderfully captures this extraordinary light. And so keep this painting in mind as you look at Venetian paintings in this last lecture on the Italian Renaissance. Whew. Both the Raphael and Bellini Madonna, oops, there it comes, are painted in oil. So what differences do you see? Well, both artists use color masterfully, but Bellini, typical of Venetian painters, used softer, more layered colors. Raphael's oil painting still in many ways resembles tempera with its sharp, bright colors. Like Leonardo in Florence and Rome, the Venetians explored the potential of oil paint for producing more subtle gradations of color and shadow. Notice, too, the much more powerful role played by light in the Bellini painting. St. Peter and St. Jerome are cast into shadow. The virgin and child are bathed in a light that seems to be actually emanating from a real source. This is not just heavenly light. Uh, we'll see much more of this when we get to Baroque art. Uh, this isn't in your uh, textbook, but I'm including it because it so masterfully demonstrates the gradations of color and the superb depiction of directed light that's, that's typical of Venetian painting. By the way, the Doge was the elected ruler of the Republic of Venice. Venice had very intriguing and complicated politics. I wish I had time. But looking at the painting, note that the palette of color is vivid, but it's also subdued, if that's not a contradiction. Again, this is typical of Venetian art, very clear, strong colors, but not in bright primary tones. This is not your Crayola crayon uh, kind of painting. In our next unit, uh, we're going to study the Northern Renaissance, and you will see then that the Venetians owed a considerable debt to the Dutch and Flemish painters who first experimented with oils and also sought new ways to depict light. Stay tuned, we're going to be getting there very soon. Now with this painting by Giorgione, we again see the subtle gradations, sorry, I feel like I'm overusing that word subtle, but the subtle gradations of subdued colors, the play of light and shadow, but this painting also represents another important aspect of Venetian art. I've already said the Venetians were less focused on the intellect, more focused on the senses. Nature plays a more central role in many Venetian paintings, and what is called here a pastoral mood, so kind of a sentimental view of nature. There's a romantic feel to this work that, to my mind, recalls Botticelli, but with softer lines and colors. By the way, this painting's juxtaposition of nude females with clothed men uh, would be copied by many later artists, so stay tuned. The Venetians brought the landscape from Northern Europe to Italy, as well as oils. Uh, we've seen landscapes featured in high Renaissance paintings. So you think of Leonardo's Virgin of the Rocks or Raphael's Madonna of the Meadow. But this painting is often considered the first true Italian landscape. So what is this painting about, do you think? Well, if you're not sure, you are in good company. Art historians are still puzzling over what this painting could mean, and they have yet to reach any kind of consensus. But again, we see the Venetian elements, subtle but strong coloration, clear and highly directed light, a pastoral or natural setting, a strong mood of sensuality. Well, okay. 
competition. Again, sorry, this one's a little blurry. Uh, he's the last of our superstars, but since I am running out of time, he is not going to get the attention he deserves. He painted this self-portrait when he was about 70 years old. Titian had a long, rich career, and there are a lot of Titians out there for you to see in museums around the world. Titian began his artistic career, interestingly enough, apprenticed to a mosaicist, and that may contribute to his use of reflective light. But as a young man, he went to work for Bellini. So this masterwork was actually Titian's first major commission. The brilliant light shows Titian's mosaic past and also the Venetian's debt to Byzantine art, that kind of gold background. But the combination of stability and movement is characteristic of the High Renaissance, especially Michelangelo. Again, you see the strong colors, the vibrant light of Venetian painting, combined with Titian's superb skills as a portraitist. This is something he had in common with Raphael. To my mind, this is one of the most beautiful and most human Marys in Italian art. I notice, too, the foreshortening of God the Father. Titian's learned from his fellow Italian masters. So here we have another monumental painting. It's more than 16 feet high. So what's different about Titian's compositional pyramid? Well, it's off-center. It's really a scaling, not an isosceles triangle, if you'll forgive a little geometry. Uh, it draws our attention to this diagonal that begins with the, pa the patron in the left-hand corner kneeling before the Virgin. It passes over St. Peter and then focuses on this brilliantly lit but off-center mother and child. Uh, Pissarro, by the way, commanded the papal forces against the Turks, and um, that partly explains the prominent place given to St. Borgia, just a little historical detail. That's the Borgia flag. This was a Borgia pope. Uh, the perspective is also off-center. If we follow the orthogonal lines of the steps, uh, they would intersect at a vanishing point to the left of the canvas, and it's quite different from other Renaissance works, such as Masaccio's Tribute Money or Leonardo's Last Supper, in which the vanishing point lies at the center of the painting in an area of primary visual importance. Now this painting, oops, did I just lose it? has an interesting composition. There it goes. An inverted pyramid with diagonals that are connected both by line and by color. Oops, I was afraid that was going to happen. Let's go back. Uh, so note how the two smaller figures on the right balance the reclining nude. And by the way, this is also going to be a very influential and much copied painting. We'll see it again when we look at some later work. Notice also the balancing of the red of her cushion, the serving woman's skirt. This painting, too, will have considerable influence over later artists. Oops, now I'm going backwards again. I'm sorry. Ah, there we go. Uh, Titian also loved to paint pastoral scenes. This one is based on a Greek myth. Ariadne has just been abandoned by her lover, Theseus. But in this painting, she's discovered by Bacchus, really presented as a teenager, a younger man. He leaps, maybe a little awkwardly in the air, to meet the woman he loves at first sight. So, what, the, what are those Venetian features that we see? Vibrant but carefully modulated color. Note, I'm trying not to say subtle again. The brilliant light behind the clouds, the lovingly depicted landscape, the sensuality and the dramatic portraiture, all of these make this quintessentially Venetian. So what's different about Titian's pyramid? Oops, that was left over from the last question. Sorry about that. Okay, Ooh, this is quite a race we've run through the Italian Renaissance. If you have time, enjoy this final video about our last artist, Titian. Remember the rape of Lucretia from very early Roman days? I think Ms. Jacobs told you about that. So here's Titian's famous painting of the story, and this is just the teaser. The entire 25-minute video gives a step-by-step -step account of how the painting would have been produced by an artist who's actually reproducing it in front of you. For those of you who are artists who are interested in producing art, engaged in producing art, I think you might find this interesting, although at this point you may very well think that if you ever see another art video, you're going to break your TV or your computer. At any rate, good luck with your essays, which I'll be hearing soon. I will have a test review podcast for you in the next few days, and then we will head north.